Hi Mark, thank you for joining me today. Could you please start by sharing your background and your current focus? Hi Rebecca, thank you so much for having me today. It's a, it's a real joy to be talking to you uh, from across the Atlantic on a very sunny morning here in New Jersey. Um, uh, I, I, um, for the past, uh, really for the past 15 years or so, I've been working in the healthcare industry. Uh, and about seven months ago, I decided to set up my, on my own uh, as an independent consultant. Um, but prior to that, I had been working at uh, Johnson & Johnson, and primarily in their corporate communications group where I was responsible for, for one of the people who were responsible for media relations. And in that role, uh, I was the one who picked up the phone and, and, and talked with uh, reporters from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the, uh, uh, the Financial Times or, or whoever uh, when they had questions about the company. And then about six years ago, uh, we started to notice a, a really significant change in the way in which Johnson & Johnson and, indeed, uh, most companies were being covered in the more traditional press. And we recognized that a lot of the, the way in which the traditional press was, was handling and reporting on companies was being influenced pretty dramatically by um, uh, sort of the new online media, and in particular, uh, bloggers. And so we decided that we needed to figure out a way to start to foster stronger uh, relationships, but also have a, a means to tell the company's story uh, online. And so uh, in working with the, with the group, uh, I, I helped to launch the company's first uh, corporate, uh, corporate blog. Now, there had been a blog that had been launched a few months earlier um, uh, that, that focused on the history of Johnson & Johnson. Uh, but the blog that I launched, uh, J&J BTW, uh, was really uh, focused on providing the company with a, a, a platform to tell its own story in its own words in an unmediated environment. But perhaps even more importantly, uh, the intent was to provide a springboard for the company to be able to uh, engage uh, in conversations with other people online and also to foster and to start to uh, refine some relationships with uh, members of this online media, uh, and in particular the health bloggers. We, we quickly discovered that, um, in fact, the audience, was, the audience itself is much broader than just health, lo health bloggers, and I'll get into that maybe a little bit later, um, and, in fact, that the, the audience actually include more general consumers, moms, uh, dads, uh, people who are, who are interested in the, uh, uh, in the company for a variety of reasons, not just from a business perspective or not just uh, from a perspective looking at it from, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of health. Um, from the corporate blog, we ended up launching a uh, Twitter feed, a Facebook page, and I also worked very closely with Rob Halper and his uh, YouTube channel, uh, and then began to look for ways to generate stronger relationships and, and foster uh, you know, more meaningful interactions with different people online, and so um, you know, engaged in a number of sort of outreach programs. Uh, and all of this uh, provided me with, with insights that we then took back and, and uh, uh, took back into the organization through education and training programs, but also by working very closely with the various brand teams within J&J &J, uh, to help them develop approaches that were appropriate, uh, credible, and uh, could actually be conducted in, 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 uh, in light of the company's uh, policies. Um, I, you know, about seven months ago, I decided to leave J&J &J and set up on my own as a consultant, and uh, my, my primary role now is providing uh, communications services uh, support for both marketing and more traditional public relations teams to help them develop a uh, and find a voice uh, to be able to interact with people in the, the new online environment through uh, through various digital platforms, traditional outreach, uh, as well as uh, social media. Um, and so that's really where I am now. And my clients range from everything from you know the traditional healthcare companies. Uh, to also those who are outside of the traditional healthcare space, including some consumer products companies. And I have to say I've been enjoying the, uh, the change immensely uh, and learning a great deal in the process, uh, and which, is, uh, which has been sort of fun given the, 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 the rapidly changing online environment. And in your experience, what do you think are the key considerations for pharma companies when they're launching social media campaigns? Yeah, and I, and I think I think you know I, I I think the the important thing to to bear in mind is that social media in itself should not be kind of set apart in isolation. One of the one of the things that sure. that I uh, recoil in horror uh, with at times is when people talk about developing a social media strategy, and and the reason why is because to me social media is is 
can't in itself be a standalone strategy. Um, it needs to be part of a, a broader uh, strategy that the brand or the business or uh, whoever it might be needs to put into place to, to achieve their, their goals. Uh, and that strategy may incorporate uh, other digital, digital platforms, you know, traditional websites, uh, as well as uh, other digital mechanisms. It may include a mobile component, and it may include social media, and it may include a variety of more traditional outreach uh, through traditional press, through traditional media. Um, it may involve some, some face-to-face time. So to me, social media should not be uh, set in, in isolation. It needs to be part of a much broader sort of integrated initiative. And the, and the way that one uh, a company should, should, should figure that out is by better understanding its audience and making a determination about whether or not social media should be part of their, their, their overarching strategy. Uh, and that depends a lot on you know, knowing kind of where their audience is, where they're congregating, what they're looking for, uh, and, but also understanding the role that the company might be able to play in that environment. And by that I mean, you know, should, should the company be there to sort of actively engage in conversation? Should it be there to provide content and information? And if so, you know, is, is a social media platform or channel the best way to, to, to uh, spread that information? Uh, so, so to me, you know, you know, what's the most important consideration that a company needs to take into to account? Uh, it, it, the first step is really to understand the audience, and, and that starts by listening and analyzing the tone and tenor of the conversation and making a determination about whether or not you know, social media should be a piece of that. What do you think needs to change in order for pharma to fully embrace social media? And, and I think the first, the first part of that question has to be, you know, goes back to what you asked earlier, which is, you know, um, you know, what companies need to take into account before developing a social media um, uh, pra- uh, approach. And a lot of that mm-hmm. really depends on understanding the needs of the customer. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that, 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 and you can see this in a number of companies, are, are, are instituting these, putting the customer at the center of all of their activities. So you, I've seen, you know, Bristol Myers Squibb has been out publicly talking about this. Sanofi's been talking about this. And I know at other organizations, there are a number that are trying to, you know, put the customer at the center of all things. And I think that's key, uh, and it's key for, for a, a very different reason um, than, than you might expect. Um, one of the things that is very notable within consumer products companies that are really starting to use social media in a strategic way to support their business objectives is that they are um, the, 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 they're, 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 they're blending the right disciplines to be able to support that social media um, component. And, and so if you really look at the CPG companies, one of the things that the, the leaders in this field are doing is that they're blending multiple disciplines to be able to provide that level of support. So it's not just you know, a marketing function that's engaging through a social media channel to drive certain messages. It's not just a public relations function that's you know, working, using social media, again, to either drive messages or to, to provide relationships. And it's not just being done through a customer service function. It's really almost a blending of all three of those um, functional areas. And, and, and the reason why they seem to be pulling into that kind of model is because, that's, because social media in itself is not just a venue for, for, for pushing messages. It's one for, for interaction, and it's one in which a lot of customers are now expecting to have a degree of support and service um, that um, uh, that could you know traditionally used to come through a telephone customer service support line, and so one of the things that really needs to be put into place, uh, or it's being put into place at CPG companies that may need to be emulated within a pharma company, is to create the right structures and the right processes to be able to provide that level of support for their customers through their social media channels. So it's not just a one-way push communication, that it becomes one in which there is interaction and engagement, again, in, term, in the terms that their customers now expect. And what digital campaigns have you noted within Pharma that you deem to be a success? I think from what I've seen, it seems to me that, that uh, Sanofi has been doing a pretty bang-up job in their diabetes franchise in terms of creating relationships with sort of key influencers. And to me, that's just a more notable um, uh, efforts in terms of, of providing a different kind of face to the company in that space. Um, you know, uh, again, back to what I was just uh, trying, to, trying to speak to, um, 
you know, one of the one of the things that that occurs through through social one of the things that social media is doing is it's giving people and and by people you know you can t- look to you know general consumers or physicians or whoever it might be it's giving those individuals the tools and the capabilities to start to redefine the relationships with more traditional organizations whether those be you know um, uh, pharmaceutical companies whether those would be um, uh, you know, traditional companies, whether those would be, you know, um, other institutions like uh, colleges or universities, or whether it be governments. And because they have that capability to kind of redefine those relationships, people are redefining those in their own terms. And by that, what they're looking for tends to be, you know, that level of support, that level of service, that level of, of connection and, and information gathering and, and the ability to gather information that really is useful and meaningful uh, that, that they can then use to apply to their own lives. Um, from what I've seen, I think Sanofi kind of gets that, and one of the things that they've done is they've created um, you know, this ability to um, use multiple digital platforms to provide content and information that, that people in the diabetes community find useful and actionable, um, and, and they seem to be, be, be creating kind of an infrastructure that provides that level of support that I think people are now expecting. You know, in addition, I think there have been some other notable um, uh, programs from AstraZeneca that, that go along in the same, same light, as well as from, uh, um, you know, again, providing that level of, of support and service, particularly through their Twitter feed, a, uh, AZ Cares. And what are the most common mistakes that you see being made when it comes to social media use within healthcare, both by pharma and broader healthcare organizations? Yeah, I think the you know some of the some of the some of the mistakes uh, that are being made is uh, are, are by not understanding your audience um, and creating content that is really uh, about the organization projecting themselves on that audience rather than it providing the kind of information and co- uh, content that people need. I recently had a, a deeper examination of a number of different YouTube channels that were available. Uh, by um, a variety of companies in this space. And it was really quite remarkable uh, in looking at them, um, one, kind of understanding the the costs associated with creating those channels, and then to really look at the level of interactivity that exists and the the number of followers. Uh, It became very clear that the content itself that was being created just didn't resonate with those audiences. And, And when one actually looked at most of the you know, and again, as a sweeping generalization, when one would look at the content, you suddenly it, it became very apparent that the content itself um, was really more about the company telling the the people what they want, what the company wanted to tell, rather than being in a position to provide kind of the useful content, the actionable content that people might be be looking for. Um, in contrast, you know, one of the things that you notice is that people are again, if we're just looking at video content in particular. You know, people are looking for video content that um, uh, can help them, you know, make make informed decisions, help them sort of apply things to their own lives. And one, what becomes clear is that the the kind of healthcare related content that becomes more spreadable, more shareable, more more viewable, is uh, content that provides a how to, you know, <laughs> how to improve your diet, how to how to uh, how to prep for a particular type of surgery? How to recover from a from a particular operation? How to create uh, um, uh, food and and uh, uh, information that that are food or or or, or, or dietary um, uh, considerations that that can help you recover from a, from a procedure? Mm-hmm. So you know, to me, it's 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 coming back to understanding your audience, and I think one of the things that I think is probably the biggest mistake that tends to be made in the industry is that they they still don't necessarily understand what it is that that the consumers are looking for looking for as they're going through their their healthcare journey. Now everyone's talking about the new social networking tool Google Plus and comparing it to Facebook. What opportunities can you see for pharma for using Google Plus? Well, you know, I, I think you know. Again, you look at you look at Facebook, you look at look at look at Google Plus. All of these, the success of using any of these platforms, all depends on the willingness of the company to be able to interact, to converse, and to be able to share information uh, on a um, on a on a regular basis. And again, in in terms of the way in which um, uh, 
people now expect to be be interacted with. I mean, one of the, or to, to interact with, and and one of the things that you know we saw, we we already went through kind of a first phase of the adaptation of various social media platforms for the pharma companies, where a lot created various Facebook pages, um, and um, um, you 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 in looking again very much like with the video content, if you actually looked at a number of these pages, you realize the level of interactivity, the level of, of conversation was, was minimal to say the least, and in the pages didn't attract a lot of followers. And a lot of that had to do with the, um, uh, the unwillingness the, um, uh, to, to converse, but also just the, the fact that companies weren't ready to do so. You know, to me, Google Plus provides a, a, another you know, obviously another platform that can be used, and, and one of the advantages, of course, is that you can create, you know, circles where you may have, you know, more more control over the content, where you can have smaller groups that you can kind of interact with. Um, but again, the success of using that is going to depend upon the willingness of the organization to be able to interact and converse. I mean, to be perfectly honest, you can use other platforms now if you wanted to create a closed network to have more private conversations. Companies could be doing that now in a relatively safe environment through other channels and other platforms. But I think a lot of it comes down to, one, you know, is that what their, their customers are looking for and whether those customers be patients or whether it be physicians? Two, whether the companies actually have the mechanisms in place to be able to do that? And, and three, um, you know, do the organizations have something that they're willing to share uh, that's going to be able to provide it, that kind of support for those organizations? And, you know, again, back to your question about where companies are, are kind of, uh, you know, may not necessarily be, be, be uh, catching the boat or, or, or working properly here, a lot of this is going to come back to the fact of whether or not the companies, you know, have either the structural or there's cultural changes in place to be able to, to uh, um, engage properly there. And where do you see social media use heading within pharma? What channels, audience, and objectives do you see as being important in this space? <laughs> it's a huge question. Um, <laughs> it's pretty yeah. big. I mean, I, I actually think that there's a lot more opportunity to, to use closed networks uh, to converse with, with healthcare professionals um, in, in a more safe environment. Um, I think that there may also be a greater opportunity for companies to start using the existing platforms, um, but to be able to reach out to individuals, thought leaders, uh, influencers in that space to foster stronger relationships with them. So to me, it's, it's not even so much a question of the platform, it's more the question of the methodology and the philosophy. Mark, thank you very much for your time and for your insights. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm.